Hey everyone, this is Eric. Before we start this episode, a quick disclaimer. During the recording of this episode, we had some technical issues. Now, nothing serious, but as the episode goes along, you might hear some kind of weird echoey stuff where part of the audio seems distant or even a little bit delayed. Don't worry about it, okay? Your device is still functioning at full capacity. What happened was John and my audio sort of leaked over onto Father's mic, and so we've done our best to clean it up, but when Father's speaking, if John and I made any sounds in the background, if we laughed, and we certainly did, or if we agreed with Father, we've tried to pare that down, so you're only going to hear us through Father's microphone, or through his speakers, don't be dismayed. Everything is okay. We apologize for the inconvenience and trust in your patience and your understanding. We hope that you're going to enjoy this episode and what a special guest indeed. So let's get that guitar guy in here to get us started. Welcome to the Catholic Forge, a conversational podcast where we gather to explore our Catholic faith and discuss how it forms our lives. All are welcome to join in this conversation and journey. Thank you for listening. Hey everyone, welcome to the show. This is Eric in Missouri. This is John in Illinois. And and John, we have an exceptionally special guest tonight, Father Ken Geraci, broadcasting, podcasting live out of Auburn, Kentucky. Welcome, Father. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me, guys. We're yes. delighted. Yes, and, and so... I met Father Ken at a diocesan event called Family Vocation Day. It was at a parish in northern Kansas City. A wonderful occasion. And uh, you had some options of breakout sessions to attend. And so, uh, so Tori and I went, to, uh, we went to, to Dino's, who I think we will hear on this show someday. He is John from the future, and we'll tell you more about that later. But then we also went to, to Father Ken's, and I'm telling you, we had not gotten... Three minutes into his talk, I leaned over to Tori and I said, this man is the Catholic Forge incarnate. All of the qualities are here. and uh, It's true. <laughs> this is what he came back and told me. <laughs> and said, uh, we have to get him on. And so, uh, indeed, right, I mean, before, well, after the talk was over, but before we left, I, I, I went up and shook his hand and, and I asked, you know, would you come on the show? And he said, yes. And that was, oh, golly, and... Did you think you were being attacked by this strange bearded man? I mean, I would have been so shocked as this man came up and said, would you be on my show? I thought this is when all of the red signals in my mind that say, run, <laughs> run. This is the Unabomber. <laughs> no, no, no. It was it's perfectly natural. This happens to me all the time. I'm crazy men with beards. Just It's just standard. Okay. <laughs> that is uh, comforting in a way. But, uh, but he, he graciously agreed, and uh, we missed an opportunity to get together last weekend, or quite recently, when, you, when he was in Wichita and I'm in Kansas City. But uh, we, you know, we decided, uh, can we just do it over Skype? And so here we are. And, uh, and so we've had uh, a few special guests on the show, for those who listen, and if you're new to the show... Uh, certainly if you came here by virtue of Fathers of Mercy or your association to Father Ken, welcome, we're truly welcome. Um, but with the other priest gentleman we had, Father Andrew, we began with a question that cuts to the measure of a man. And, really uh, where we could end the conversation tonight. <laughs> and it is not a rhetorical question like, which is better, you know, Star Wars or Star Trek or... Uh, Lord of the Rings or Harry Potter or the Beatles or the Eagles. These are rhetorical questions, you know. But here, here, uh, Father, we have a little hypothetical question or uh, from John's youth ministry, you know, a sort of leanings, an icebreaker. And the question is this. If you could choose to have one superpower, which would it be and why? Now, do you feel that you can answer immediately, or do you want a minute to kind of ruminate on it? Oh, jeez. I, I need to ruminate on that real quick. I, I need to... He's never given that option before, <laughs> Father. He, he must really like you. No, no. no. Well, he's, he's being polite. That's... that's uh, because he doesn't want me to hang up. No, 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 please. Well, uh, uh, we, can, we can speak for ourselves, uh, because John and I have done this on the show at least once before. Now, John, what would you pick? I, I had picked flying. I, I, mm. I couldn't... Uh, I couldn't imagine anything but flying. 
But then when I heard yours and Ben answers, I felt very selfish. So no, uh, no, you you can do such good by being a flying person. Uh, no, I would do no good. I would just fly. <laughs> just, it would be so delightful. Just you'd, you'd have remarkable gas economy. I I, I chose uh, I chose to have uh, some sort of power of healing. Uh, kind of a, like a combination, of not having like Wolverine's healing capabilities, but being able to do just kind of healing things in general. So that was my and to my, heal my other response. people. He was so noble. Yeah. I felt ashamed I, for my fly. But but you could also heal yourself, not to grant immortality, but I could always like heal my own maladies. So that that's not so bad. That's a perk. Yeah, yeah. So I I'd have to go with the virtue of Captain America. I, I guess that's the. That's that's where I gotta go. Um, that's the uh, because I'm a huge Iron Man fan, but that's not that's all tech, you know. That's uh, um, but uh, only only Iron Man because it's Eucharistic. Um, Iron Man changed for me once I started to do exposition when you put the our Lord in the monstrance, like he puts the arc reactor in his chest. Well, you, well it's, it's it's a reverse. It's a reverse. When we receive Holy Communion, it, you become a true superhero. You you become supernatural. It is what power Tony Stark is an analogy that points to the Eucharist that powers us. That's wonderful. I'm stealing that. Uh, that's, I'm gonna get that's copyrighted. Remarkable. Yeah, that, that's beautiful, Father. So you, so you see, John, I don't want to hear it. All these months have been like, oh, Eric wants to bring in this Father Ken. He says, okay. <laughs> so, that, that's but but so not so true, you would father. so we've been delighted. <laughs> no, that's that's awesome. Uh, but but you so you wouldn't pick like an offensive ability. You you mean th- what is inside of Captain America? The virtue. Yeah. The virtue, because I, I think that's what that's what made Captain America Captain versus Red Skull is that he was a man of virtue, and so uh, the the interior reality is just it's the it's a substantial reality that led to the external manifestation of the of the uh, effects of that drug, whatever. So, pretty good for an answer on the fly. He, he caught a superpower most of us wouldn't even recognize the virtue within. As yeah, as a superpower. Uh, yes, that's no. That is that is remarkable, Father. Well, thank you. We have that's, been schooled. Well, it's a, it's a little Solomon there. You pray for wisdom. What can you do? Yeah. Oh my gosh. Sure enough. Um, well, uh, you know, obviously, uh, already we have uh, you know a, a skilled uh, a speaker and uh, uh, well aware of scripture and theology. And on top of all, he loves the comic books. And so, Father, if if you would. Uh, John and I are going to turn our mics off. We won't do that. But if if you would tell us some of your story, um, for as little or as much as you like, where you started, where you've been, and how you got to where you are, uh, what we you, you know it, it, for uh, for all the for all the you know the ritualistic people, here's your vocation story. Yeah, well, I I never wanted to be a priest, and I didn't like Christianity, so we'll start there. Um, <laughs> Welcome to the Catholic Forge. <laughs> Welcome to the Catholic Forge. Is, is, there, is, there, is there another speaker we could hear, please? <laughs> <laughs> that should be our opening tagline. I didn't want to be a priest and I didn't like Christianity. Welcome to the Catholic Forge. <laughs> so I, I grew up in a nominal Catholic family. Um, I, I went to church every Sunday with my family. We went through the motions. We dressed up. We looked the part. Um, but never um, did I have that interior life. My parents had it, but me and my brothers didn't. We grew up in the in the eighties, uh, where the you know catechesis was that you're special, Jesus loves you, and you know whatever. Um, right. And so we never really. And then it, not only did we not receive it, we were not interested in it. Um, we were too involved with ourselves, sports, uh, different activities. Um, so so for me, going to mass every Sunday was literally the most painful thing in the world. Um, whenever I go to churches, I say there are four groups of Catholics that come to church on Sunday. The first group are those who love our faith. They absolutely love it. They go to the confession on a regular basis. Um, they make holy hours. They come to daily mass. They go to um, confession. And I already mentioned that. But they, they just <laughs> love our faith, and they work hard at it. Um, that's the first group. The second group are those of us who want to be in that first group. That's the second group. Because sometimes... Uh, we're struggling. Sometimes to keep God in that number one spot is hard. I put myself in this second group sometimes because there are days I find myself so busy doing things for God, I forget to spend time with God. 
Um, it's not uncommon to travel so much or do these things. And anyone who has children knows exactly what I'm talking about. Uh, you're just if you can get your family to mass, success. You know, <laughs> we've done great. Um, you know, I had one mother told me she spent many years uh, disciplining more in mass than she did praying. And so, mm. if you have to fight to live your faith, if you have to struggle, if it's if it's hard. Don't stop. The soldier that lays down doesn't win the war. So that's the second group. Those who have to struggle to live our faith. You want to be in that first group, but we are where we are. And it's a broad group. Third group, fire insurance Catholics. These who... <laughs> <laughs> that is a lovely term. Yeah, they believe that they come... Now, now in norm, when, I, when I say this at Mass, I normally follow up with a punchline that, now these people aren't here today because it's not Christmas or Easter. Oh, <laughs> shots fired. So, you know, but again, these are people who show up from time to time thinking if they do, it's, it's going to work out. And, and again, I'm not, I'm not judging. I'm just saying I understand uh, because the fourth group is my favorite group. The fourth group are the hostages, all right? <laughs> Those who are forced to come to Mass against their will. So at one church I was at, I had, had a mom, two boys started the chuckling, and, two, and the mom swung and she hit them both. <laughs> She got she got one with the elbow, the other with the forehand. That is skill. It was technique. It was beautiful. <laughs> and so the question I ask is that how do you go from being a hostage? How do you go from where mass, faith, and religion is literally the worst part of your, your existence to now it being the highlight and the joy of my day? And the answer is simple. It's one encounter with Jesus. And that's what changed my life. You know, I grew up in this nominal Catholic family. We went through the motions, but I fell away. I'm very scientific in my thinking. I love astrophysics. Um, I, I just love deep science and deep thinking. And I began to question, how could the articles of science be true and God exist? And so, and because my family did not pray together, my family did not stay together. Um, my senior year of high school, my parents divorced. I began to play my mom against my dad, <clears throat> and I gave up faith and religion altogether. So I become agnostic at this point. And this is the big challenge for me, is that I just want to be successful and happy in life. And so I pursue this, and I pursue it hard. Um, I went off to college to work on my business degree. Uh, my senior year of college, I was recruited out of school to go to work for a computer company doing advanced research and development on these little devices called um, MP3 players. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So we were one company among many working on this technology, just trying to get a dog in the fight. And as we were working on that technology and doing some different, really interesting work, uh, my boss came up to me and he had an idea for a new software company. So myself and about six other guys, including my boss, uh, we all worked nights and weekends on top of our day jobs for this little project. Um, after about a year and a half of this, a venture capital firm gave us four and a half million dollars to fund our little project. So here I am, 24, 25 years old, thinking that I've arrived. You know, my ego is the size of a, mm. of a cathedral. <laughs> sure. And my boss came to me one day, and we'd worked together for a while. Now, Mike is a devout Catholic, great family man, too. And he came to me, and, and now this is a synopsis of many conversations, but he effectively said over those several conversations, professionally, I have no problem with you. Personally, I do. Uh, I've heard you tell people that you're a Christian. I've heard you tell people that you're Catholic, uh, if convenient. Uh, but you've told me you don't pray, you don't go to church, and frankly, some of the stories you tell are unbecoming a man, let alone a Christian. Wow. So which is it? Now, first of all, that's a real friend. That yeah. I, I, I can honestly say I have at least one real friend in my life. I've got many. But, but at that point, he was willing to call me out. But not just to challenge me to let my yes be yes and my no be no. But more than that, to, to challenge me to be a man of God. And Mike, not, he didn't just call me out. He invited me to come to church with he and his family. So I began to come to church with he and his family. And, and I begin to see expressions of the Catholic faith in a man that I respect at prayer. My roommate at the time was Baptist, so I went to the Baptist church. I went to the Church of Christ. I went to the churches I lovingly refer to as Six Flags Over Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'm seeing all of these different things, and I'm, I'm beginning to recognize, one, that Jesus Christ is Lord, and number two, that 
there's a relationship there and that this this Christianity stuff is real. And I'm and again, a lot of prayer, a lot of study, a lot of questions. And then I begin to ask the question, which is true? Which church is true and does it matter? And so this is the journey I set off on was to understand why the Catholic Church is who she says she is. And for me, it revolved mainly around the moral issues, because I thought the Catholic Church was stupid for teaching the moral issues that it did, specifically contraception. Um, the, the sexuality stuff I can handle, I could understand that, uh, specifically premarital sex and things like that, because that's just, it's very clear in the scriptures, and, and anyone who's, who sees people who engage in these activities, you can deduce really easy that that doesn't help, it only hurts. Anyhow, so this was my journey. And so uh, I was. I tell people that uh, as I made my way from agnosticism to Christianity, now studying my way into Catholicism, how do I become a priest? Um, well, it was a date. And I realized I was supposed to be on a date, and so I lovingly say, hashtag worst date ever. <laughs> okay, here we go. So I'm dating this wonderful young woman. I, I've had several moral conversions, several Christian conversions, and one of the, the things that I had asked myself is that if I met the woman of my dreams tomorrow, would I be ready to marry her? And when I thought about it, the answer came back a resounding no. You know, I wasn't taking my Christian walk as a man of God as serious as I could. Even though I've gone through all these conversions, there, there was more I could do. And I could be more faithful and do better. And so I really set out to live that. And so about six months into this, I meet this beautiful young woman named Melissa. And uh, we start courting, really just getting to know each other, developing that friendship. And she called me one night, about eight weeks of dating, and it's starting to progress. It's starting to move a little somewhere, I think. And she says, hey, do you want to come hang out? There's a priest coming to my church. Uh, he's going to give a talk tonight. We could hang out, go for drinks later. And I'm like, ah, I don't think so. <laughs> like, I'm like, I don't know. I never met a priest that had a pulse, that seemed to enjoy what he did. And then I'm like, well, you know what? Time with you, time with God. What could go wrong? Yeah, let's let's do it. We're having margaritas afterwards. She's like, yeah. I'm like, great. Okay, all right, come on. So I'm going for the margaritas. <laughs> God gets us however He can. Yeah, it's the story of my life. I go for the girl, come home with God. Um, <laughs> so this priest, the first priest I've ever met that seemed to be really in love with what he was doing, and this guy was on fire. He was preaching up a storm. And he was just, you could see the love of God in him. And, and I'm sitting there 20 minutes into his little, his little conference he was given that night. I sat back in the pew and said to myself, if this guy says I'm signing people up in the back to become priest, I'll go. I don't know what I'll tell Melissa or my family, but I'll do it. Within 20 seconds, Melissa leans over. She elbows me. She goes, hey, are you sure you're not supposed to be a priest? Well, I freaked totally freaked out. I, I don't say anything, but I slide in the pew and I said, Lord, if he says it, I'll go. But if not, I'm off the hook. Well, he didn't say anything. And that was in November in Austin, Texas. I moved from Austin to Houston, which is about a three and a half hour drive. For four months, the thought about being a priest bothers me every day. And so I talked to someone about it and they simply said to me, what do you think is better, your plan for your life or God's plan? And I said, well, clearly God's plan is better. He said, well, go talk to someone. And so I talked to this priest and he said, listen, you got to pray. It's a long process. The best thing for you to do is get a spiritual director and just pray and ask God. I said, I, I can do that. He goes, here's the name of a young priest down the road. Go talk to him. So I go down the road, knock on the door and out walks this guy. He's about 65 years old. And I'm like, you're the young priest? A young priest. You know, I'm like, oh, you know, all my, all my, suspicions of the Catholic Church was just affirmed. You know, I'm like, are you Father so-and-so? And he goes, no, no, I'm not him. And he, he yells in the back for this other priest. And he goes, he goes, you don't look so good. And I said, you know what, man? I'm like, I gotta be honest. You're the second priest I've ever talked to. I'm freaked out. I was on a date and this guy's preaching like this and I'm thinking this and then she says this and I freak out. And now I'm standing at your doorstep. And then <laughs> as I'm saying this, out walked the same priest that was in Austin four months earlier. Wow. No. <laughs> Shut it. I can't. <laughs> Boom goes the dynamite. I'm just saying, my mind was blown. Literally, he came out and he's like, hi, how can I help you? Young guy, 40-something 40, 40 years old. And I, I shook his hand. I literally say, hi, my name is Ken Geraci, and I think I'm supposed to be a priest. And that was okay. the beginning. Wow. 
<laughs> so, all right. I'm dumbfounded. I, I, it's, I, it's incredible. It's a beautiful story. It's just, it's amazing how God works that way. And I, I like that he didn't give you that second affirmation there at the talk. He made you sweat it out, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and that's the beautiful part about God is that he's not going to force it on us because he could have dropped it on me right there and, and I probably would have gone through it, but it wouldn't have been it wouldn't have been freedom. And so this, you know, it led me to those, again, more little conversions, which is better for your life, mine or his, clearly his. Well, then take a step in that direction. And again, and I discern marriage. I mean, I was back and forth on this this vocation journey, priesthood, marriage, priesthood, marriage. I mean, I was, I was, it was even, I was like, think six months before my final vows as a religious that I still went to my spirit director and and said, I got to think about this. And, uh, you know, and again, there was nothing, nothing, no funny business going on, but I just had to pray and ask God where he was calling me. How did Melissa take the news? (laughs) Well, I was the worst date ever because she freaked me out. It's her fault. I'm just saying. So, so, so I kind of didn't call her back right away. We didn't go out for drinks that night. I was totally freaked oh. out. Her nieces hate me because, because they said, you ghosted Aunt Melissa. <laughs> yes. Well, it wasn't my fault. Anyhow, we are. You got to get dumped. Getting dumped for God is pretty good. Well, yeah, we're right. we're great friends today. We every every time I go back to Austin, we visit. Uh, she oh. is uh, she is one of my one of my dearest friends. Um, it was all right. So this is how bad I was in faith. All right. So so uh, after about I don't know how many months. Now I'm starting to discern the priesthood. I'm actually bump into her again, and, and the friendship picks back up. She's dating another guy at the time, and uh, so I have dinner with her and her family. And her mom said, well, you should go to Eucharistic Adoration if you're thinking about being a priest. And I said, what's that? <laughs> sure, yeah. And, she's, okay. and she thought I said, where is that? Not what. She thought I said, where? And so she told me where to go. Well, there's a church not far from where you live. You can go in there. And so literally, I, this is, I literally knew so little about our Catholic faith. It just said Adoration Room. And so I walked in and I sat down. She said to spend an hour there. So I spent an hour in this room and then I left. And then I'm like, wow, I don't know if that worked. I'm like, maybe I need to go back and try it again. <laughs> so I went back the next week and I'm there 30 minutes and I'm starting to look around this room and I'm like, there's got to be more to this room than just sitting here. <laughs> it's the special box room. Yeah, you go and they sit there. <laughs> Literally, I'm not making this up. So I start looking around the room and then the monstrance, it was just kind of, it was, they had it secured on, in the wall, but it was a glass wall that looked into the chapel. So you didn't, you know, I didn't see it right away. So anyhow, so I, I spent my first hour and a half of Eucharistic adoration having no clue Jesus was even there. <laughs> so any of you who feel feel that you're you're weak in your faith um understand that i have one question and you i think you answered it but i don't think you answered it with like a a big bright light so you mentioned that obviously for you and i would say you're saying in general that the real um the the real crux of conversion is just but one encounter with with the risen Jesus. And and you went through the kind of the prologue there and you got through when you were in that business venture and then when you were dating and which moment was sort of that moment for you? Was it when your boss called you out or was it at the vocation talk or or was it something else in the mix? Was there another moment somewhere along the way? Um, uh, as far as moments go, I think there are several, I, I think when you go through my vocation story, there are several key moments. The big one for me was, was overcoming, uh, agnosticism coming to Christianity. Right. That's a big thing because I sure. studied Eastern philosophy. Um, just, I mean, because I, you know, I was a spiritual guy, so I had to overcome, overcome that to come to the concept that Jesus Christ is Lord. That's number one. Number two was the moral conversion. And then three, the conversion to Catholicism. And so so in those three stages, um, Jesus Christ being Lord, you know, I flirted with the idea, whatever I thought about it, 
but I was at a Baptist church, Hyde Park Baptist Church in Austin, Texas. And the youth minister stood up. My roommate was taking me there uh, just to expose me to different, to, you know, he's trying to get me Baptist. And the youth minister stood up and he said, if you want to change your life forever, pick up the New Testament and read one chapter every day. Now, for our listeners, just to be clear, a, a chapter of the New Testament is sometimes half of a page up to two pages in length. So we're talking two to five minutes. So he said, if you want to change your life forever, read one chapter of the New Testament every day. And he said, if you doubt God's existence, start with the Gospel of John. And I said, I'll take your challenge, and I'm going to come back in a month, and I'm going to thump you on your head with your Bible and say, I don't need to believe this. <laughs> and the irony of all this, guys, is that we owed Hyde Park Baptist Church in Austin, Texas, a huge debt of gratitude for my vocation to the priesthood. Mm. Wow. I'm so wow. grateful for them. I am so, because they help lead me into the scriptures. They help open my heart to the word of God. And by reading the scriptures, and again, God is working there. And so not only did I have questions, he would, you know, again, it's like you do things with people and they reflect questions back to you, or there's things that encounter in your life that, that make it come alive or, or challenge it. And so, you know, God is sitting there working with me in this. And it was absolutely incredible. So that was really the heart of it for me, was moving from agnosticism to Christianity by encountering Jesus Christ in prayer. And again, it was a slow, methodical thing. There was not a lightning bolt moment, um, but, but that was a really big one, and in, in to make that ascent of faith. You know, I, I, going on to some of the questions and applications into our lives, one of the questions we wanted to really talk to you about was about outreach to millennials. Um, so many millennials, I think, are in a similar situation to where you were very, very uh, into success uh, or into their world. Uh, a lot of them would say that they're spiritual, but they're not religious. They, they're not necessarily opposed to God, but they're just kind of indifferent to God. What are? I think you gave a wonderful one. That would be a great challenge to people to to read. Uh, read scripture every day. Uh, hmm. What are other things that you'd say, though, in ministering to millennials and to people that are, are kind of having that 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 say a similar experience to what you had? That's a challenge because you've got to take action, and you've got to take action outside of yourself. The hard part for millennials is, is that it, they've just been affirmed into. Nasal, navel gazing nothingness in a certain regard. There, there's not, there is not a strong criteria that there is objective truth outside of you, and they've been told whatever you feel is yeah. What's your truth? That's your truth, and you own your truth, and that's what I believed is that we all had our own truth, and it wasn't until my boss came up to me and said, "There's a lot of duplicity in your life. You're having fun." but are you truly happy? Mm. And I did. I had a lot of fun. I mean, I had a, I had all the money. I mean, literally, when we sold our company, we, we, it was a fire sale. We didn't make a ton of money once we sold it. But I literally had enough cash to live an entire year without working. Mm. And so I had the toys and the gadgets and the, all, of the, all of the things that I could want. But it was, I was still hungering for so much more. And the world right now is... is has a vested interest in their denial of Christianity. It has a vested interest in them saying no. And, and it's, so I guess my, my response to that is how do we reach out to a millennial? It is, and, or if there's any millennials listening, is, is to challenge yourself outside of yourself, hmm. to pick up the scriptures and, and give God your time. Take off the earbuds um, you know, again, as, as I just worked with a bunch of uh, youth in, uh, at a high school this past week, and one of the things we ask is that if you have your earbuds in or if you're doing Snapchat or whatever, uh, can you hear me very well? And they said, absolutely not. And I said, well, the same thing with God is that we've got to make space for God. And the second that you start making space for God, the second that you have an opportunity to hear and to grow and realize so I think that's the key element is create silence in your life, put the screens away. Um, I mean, my gosh, the statistics on, on millennials, youth of, of social media and iPhones and 
Uh, it's it's horrific what what they're being exposed to and how it's destroying their brains, literally rewiring their brains. So we've got to step outside of ourselves and we've got to commit ourselves to a life of prayer. So I guess the, a simple answer for you, John, one, silence. Make some silence in your life. Create some space for God and give it to him. Say, God, I give you this time. I don't know what I'm doing, uh, but I give it to you. That's a great prayer. <laughs> Number two. Uh, read the sacred scripture. Start in the New Testament. Don't start in Leviticus or Numbers. You'll be... <laughs> start in the New Testament, okay? Um, if, you're, if you're really doubtful or you have questions, uh, start with the Gospel of Mark. All the exorcisms, all deliverances, and lots right. of healings. It's action-packed, you know? <laughs> and, then, and then go to adoration. Make acts of faith saying, God, I want to know you. Lead me, guide me, put people in my in my life to know you, um, and then study um, again and, and be be literally. I thought contraception one of the key issues, and this issue could have possibly converted me alone. The issue of contraception. I thought the Catholic Church was so and stupid. I thought it was wrong. I thought they were they were outside of their heads. How could contraception be wrong? The pill. Um, uh, uh, barrier methods, things like that. how could this possibly be wrong? Again, this is an old church hanging to archaic ways. And then I came across Dr. Janet Smith's original talk on contraception, why not? And that laid the groundwork. If you want to listen to one thing, get the original uh, talk of Janet Smith, contraception, why not? And not only did I listen to that, you look at Humana Vitae, you look at the, the teachings of the church, you, you read all these other things, and you see how contraception not only puts a barrier to life, but a barrier in your marriage, and how, how it affects communication, it affects the way that you engage one another, it affects everything. And then forget the life of grace that is now cut off in you. All of these things. And so as I began to study this issue, as a man considering marriage, felt I was called to be a husband and a father more than anything else, I was convinced that natural family planning would be the only thing for me and my spouse. Wow. To throw a little challenge in there, um, you mentioned how much our millennials are on their screens. Is so much of it is a sound bite culture. Um, it, it, you know, studies have shown that they aren't even reading an article; they just read the the headline and then make an opinion based on the headline. So, how uh, what are some ways that we can get our millennial friends to get past that? So, you said to study because the first two part, uh, options to pray, to enter into dialogue with Scripture and God, there uh, those are are reasonable things. But then to study. Man, that takes effort. I can't do that in a soundbite. I can't just read a, a headline to an article and get it. So how do we get a, a group of people that tend to want to do soundbite stuff into really studying, that crave that? Do you have any thoughts? You know, I, I you know, Father Mike Schmidt and uh, Father John Ricardo, they've got great YouTube channels. And uh, again, they're five minutes, three to three to five five minute bites. So those are great introductions. Um, those are great resources. Um, <clears throat> but how do we reach the soundbite culture? Uh, you know, I, I think we, I think, I think we just have to challenge them to move on past that because is your life, do you want your life to be a soundbite? Do you want your life to be a series of, of selfies? Uh, the, the best of, uh, you know, 30 different shots. Um, right. You know, is I mean, literally, let's let's expose soundbite culture as a lie, and and say, are you truly happy? And they're not. And and I think I want to lean on the pain, um, and help them experience that pain more fully, <laughs> and to uh, to encourage them to 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 seek fulfillment. The the millennials, when you look at the demographics and the, what they want, they want something meaningful. They want to add value. They want to uh, be part of something bigger than themselves. Um, they want to make a difference in the world. Um, there's no better place than the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church is not only universal, it's the most inclusive. It is the most diverse. It is the most non-judgmental institute on the planet. Um, we, our doors are welcome to everyone who wants to follow Jesus Christ. 
And again, this is not us putting restrictions on things. Jesus Christ said, if you want to be happy, if you want to be free, here's the way. And all you have to do, if you doubt this, people throw up the, the homosexuality issue all the time. Um, if you doubt what I'm saying, talk to any person with the same sex attraction who is living a chaste life after living a, a same sex active lifestyle. They will tell you the peace and the joy they have not being used, not giving their body over to their uh, the sensual uh, side of life, but that they recognize they have a dignity as a son or daughter of God. And there's more. So I could, I, there's so many things we could talk about on all these subjects. Yeah, that's wonderful. Thank you. I just think it's important to challenge the mentality and, and uh, you know, we've got to reach them somehow, but I, I don't have that answer. I, I can point us to, to Father John Ricardo and Father Mike Schmidt, both idols of mine. They, they're both great yeah. guys. They are spiritual uh, sponsors. <laughs> we, we claim them. So, Yeah, as, as, the, uh, as the Fathers of Mercy will now be uh, spiritual sponsors of the Catholic Porridge. But uh, if, if you could, uh, you know, speak to some of that, uh, you know, my, my question is, you know, what sort of work are you doing with the Fathers of Mercy? And And you actually didn't mention much about the fathers of mercy so could you just give us a, a, a little you know a little pill size uh, you know snapshot and then some of the work that you do and then uh, and then i do have a, a question after this kind of primer go ahead so the fathers of mercy were founded in the 1800s uh by a french priest father jean baptiste razan and we were founded specifically to preach parish missions and retreats uh, during the time of Father Razan, the French Enlightenment and the French Revolution destroyed the faith in France. And Father Razan was a diocesan priest and asked by his bishop to, uh, to go out and, and reestablish the faith. And so, long story short, we, we become an American exclusive province after many years in political exiles and things like that. And we now preach parish missions and retreats throughout the United States. We don't have a church ourselves. So my role, I actually have three roles in the community. Uh, it's just recently changed. Uh, I am the full-time vocation director. That is my full-time job. Uh, but but uh, when I'm not doing that, I'm doing missions and retreats. Uh, and then also the webmaster for our community. So... Um, uh, a parish mission is simply the Catholic version of a Baptist tent revival. We come to a church for a week at a time, and uh, we, uh, we just basically preach on the basics of the faith to help move people uh, from any of those categories we discussed to help engage them, help give them that opportunity for encounter. And do you do baptisms in rivers or lakes as well? <laughs> yes, you could. <laughs> oh, <laughs> Um, my, my question is, and it actually, it, it speaks something to, to what you said about pursuing millennials and, and getting them to sort of get outside of themselves. And here in Catholicism, we have this remarkable model of evangelization called aptly the new one, <laughs> the new evangelization. And, and so naturally that's, uh, if there's any inspiration behind this podcast and i'm guessing also the gentleman that you mentioned uh, uh father mike and, and F bishop baron and so many other uh, people who utilize social media the driving force besides you know the movement of the spirit is the new evangelization especially and i think that bishop baron is probably one of the champions of this effort as a reaction to the 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 driving <laughs> <laughs> the drums of war sounding from the camp of the new atheism. Uh, and, and so, uh, you know, specifically speaking to that, what do you see in your own work traveling about? Uh, you know, what kind of things are you, do you find yourself speaking to the most often? But then beyond that, uh, how do you see that in as a reaction to the call of the new evangelization? I think I see a lot of things like these podcasts, a lot of great use of technology. You've got a lay people, a lay movement stepping up, engaging people and working in, in a mission field that's theirs, which is fantastic. It's that universal call to holiness being lived out. I love seeing it. But the one of the best talks I've heard on the universal call to holiness and what it is, I can't remember the author's name. But he simply said, so many people look at the universal call of holiness in terms of what we are doing new. I'm sorry, what did I say? <laughs> we were talking about the new evangelization. Yes. 
Yeah, I don't know how. You don't even have to edit this. This is just too funny. We can sleep. <laughs> <laughs> one of the best talks I've heard on the new evangelization. Uh, one of the best talks I heard on the new evangelization was that the author said, um, and I can't remember who it was, but he basically said, when we talk about the new evangelization, a lot of people talk about what we as a church are doing differently. But he says, when John Paul talks about the new evangelization, at the heart of his message is that it's not that we are not only called to do something differently, but it's Christ that is now doing something different. Christ is acting differently. There are, and again, it's not that he's changed, but he's pouring out new graces, making more grace available, doing things that have never been seen in the church before. And you can see this with many of the converts that are coming in many of these extraordinary conversions and then again the the pop-up of all of this this good use of technology um when you look at the graces that are being poured out i mean i i've got to be honest i think we've all had this experience when we look around at the church we look around the world we see the things in politics and we're just like oh my gosh the devil's at the front door you know it's just it's that bad but on the same hand, the conversions that I'm seeing are, are absolutely incredible. I mean, <laughs> we've got, uh, we have these conversions. I had a, a, a person in my life, same-sex attraction, um, business professional, and we have the time of our life together. Um, she'll come to the chapel and pray. Um, you know, it's just a wonderful, wonderful friendship. And, yeah. you know, and, and I'm watching some of these things and watching these people go from, from total pagan to now on fire Catholic. You know, the, the, I just had a guy come here this morning. He, they drove in from Michigan because they were at a mission last year. They're, they're snowbirds, and so they drive back and forth. And they happened to stop Saturday night uh, where I was giving the mission. And they got their truck and trailer. And I gave the invitation for the mission. They said, well, we think we'll stay one more day to attend the first night. And they attended all five nights of the mission. <laughs> wow. And he, he, Great. he told me this morning, again, he, he told everyone at the table, he said, he goes, I was away from confession for 35 years. I had wow. pains in my body. I had all, I was on antidepressants. I had all, and he said, I went to, and I went to confession and God healed me. And so again, his, he's, he's off his antidepressants. He's, you know, there's so many things moving for him. And he came back to tell us this. And so just when we're sitting here scratching our heads, looking at what the devil's doing, the devil's over there saying, I had him. Where'd he go? Yeah. It, it's amazing how God's grace is. I, I th we see the same thing with Poland, you know, they're under this communist regime and there's no faith at all. And then it collapses. And now what a vibrant church there is in Poland. It just is, is, yeah. is phenomenal. You know, they just did this giant thing where they, they surrounded the entire country, the borders praying the rosary. So yeah, we're, we're sin abounds, grace abounds all the more. That's right. And, sure. and we're here. I, I want to bring in the divine mercy message here because I think that's so important to this conversation. Uh, when families come to me and say, I got this problem, we got that problem, we got this, we got that, you know, all of our families are messes. It's, it's, it's everywhere. Yeah. The Divine Mercy Chaplet and the Rosary are key for us. Um, when you read the Divine Mercy Diary, Faustina asks our Lord, how can you tolerate so many sins? Uh, and our Lord tells her, this message, this message of mercy is for the end times. This is it. Um, I, I liken the Divine Mercy message uh, to a store going out of business. Um, uh, you know, basically, um, you know, when a store is going out of business, there's a sign on the door that says 20% off everything. A few weeks later, 40% off. Right. Towards the 70% off, right? But, <laughs> but right before they close the doors, they put a sign up and it says, no reasonable offer will be refused. And when you read the Divine Mercy Diary, when you look at what our Lord is doing in the lives of people, he, we're, just, we're just trying to get them across the line. Again, this is where a Catholic, non-Catholic companionship is because if people are striving to live, to say yes to God, to accept His mercy, to want to walk with Him, you know what? It's not the fullness of the faith, but it's not the, the new atheism. It's not the, the world that we're living in. It's not 
giving in to the, the secular progressive society. And so where our Lord said, if they're not against us, they're for us. Um, and we can, there's so many things that we co collaborate on and can work together on. So uh, I think the Divine Mercy Chaplet is, is the most powerful thing we can do as, as families, uh, along with the rosary. I, I think we're really coming to a, a well-rounded place. I, I think that would be one last thing to ask would be about is um, marriages. What are what are ways that we can be supporting marriages, uh, both through our ministries and in our in the world? Well, we could live it the way God intended. <laughs> this is it. This is I have marriages uh, relatively it's not as active as it was a year ago, but I had a relatively active marriage ministry just from communities that I've been involved with. And I follow the, the model of Greg and Julie Alexander, and they would be a great couple to have on your, your podcast. They're incredible. Most successful marriage ministry in America that I am aware of, um, over 1,800 couples, I believe, and, and to their knowledge, less than 100 have ended in divorce, those that they have worked with directly. And these are couples from, hey, we need some maintenance, we got some issues, to those uh, in their book, Marriage 911. Uh, I believe it tells the story of the husband and wife who show up on their doorstep and they said, who wants to go first? And the husband raises his hand and he says, well, I just found out this week that my six month year old child is not mine. My wife's been having an affair. And within two weeks, that couple is sitting on the couch holding a hand back in love with a new start in their marriage. Wow. Hmm. So their success in marriage is number one, understanding God's plan for marriage. Get their book, Marriage 911. It's a really easy read, short book. Um, so understand God's plan for marriage and live it. Page 51 of the book, um, <laughs> third paragraph, I think. Greg says, <laughs> I, I love this part. Greg says, I realized that my primary responsibility in marriage was to minister to the needs of my wife. If I wasn't ministering to my wife's needs, not only emotionally and spiritually, I'm failing. And so, guys, the way to our heart is what? Food. Ooh. Just feed us. Yeah, just... <laughs> right? Well, it's a little more than that. It's food and respect. <laughs> food and respect is the way to a man's heart. We're pretty simple. But the way to a woman's heart is prayer. When a man leads his wife in prayer, there's a spiritual nourishment that takes place in her heart. Now, again, I think all men, every man that I've ever met, will acknowledge that women are better prayers than we are. They're better at church and spirituality. They, there's just a natural <laughs> capacity. Sure. But the husband's role as the head of the household, the woman, the heart, okay? It's not one above the other. If you separate the head from the heart, you're dead, right? But when the head mm -hmm. and the heart are united and the husband is leading his wife in prayer, it affirms a woman on a binary spiritual level. And when she feels nourished and, and on the binary spiritual level, then emotionally she feels affirmed and loved. And then physically it has a manifestation as well. So it doesn't matter if you're a bonehead or not, it, it's the fact that you, your wife knows at the end of the day, you care more about her soul than anything else. Hmm. And this hmm. is a great way to renew your marriage. I've got couples that have never prayed together. They, sometimes they don't even like each other. And I get them to hold hands every day and say what they're thankful for, who in their life needs prayer, and then they pray, one Our Father, one Hail Mary, one Glory Be. Doing that and forgiving one another, that's enough to heal a broken marriage. And I've seen this happen time and time and time again. Wow, that's, that's spectacular. <laughs> the, uh, the only other question is, is when can we uh, book you again? <laughs> well, uh, it, it, it's, I mean, John and I both work for parishes, and uh, I know that we're going to go into mother tomorrow morning and be like, Father, I found a father. Cancel, cancel whatever you had for the next two Advents in Lent, because we got a guy. Uh, but it... <laughs> I know a guy. You can come, but uh, uh, it just it has been. I mean, uh, John, do you have any more questions be before? No, I kind of it's start just to wrap been up? spectacular to have you, Father. Thank you so much for, yeah. for sharing. Thank you for taking your time with us. And uh, uh, Father mentioned a few things, and I've just been kind of 
quickly flitting around YouTube and, and uh, Google a little bit. And I found um, I found the Dr. Janet Smith talk. And then I did find the Alexander House, which was Greg and Julie Alexander's ministry uh, for, for marriages. And so we'll put the links to all of that, including um, uh, the, at least the website for Fathers of Mercy, but also for Father Ken's page. And I know that there you can go listen to some of his homilies if you'd like to enjoy him more um, in, in maybe a more, you know, kind of a preaching catechetical setting. Um, and then also we'll certainly include a link for the Fathers of Mercy YouTube page where they post, F Father, do you know, do they post every homily up on that page or, or what's, what's, what's the, what's the protocol there? Well, it's mainly Sunday homilies when we record them. So yeah, look out, Father uh, Michael Schmitz. You've got competition. I, I mean, I worked in advanced technology, helping develop MP3 players, and we're still selling our conferences on the compact disc, not oh to be gosh. confused with the uncompact disc. No, we're we have. <laughs> <laughs> that's a that's a that's a priest joke if there ever was one. Very good. Huh? <laughs> so we do have MP3s yeah. available on the on the. Um, the website but um Wonderful. but yeah would you if you would link at the um at the beginning of that the the mission i give um when i was talking about the the mission part of it uh why sure. be catholic um if you could just link directly to my um to my talk my conferences why be catholic on there um the mission set that i've got out of our store that'd be great I will definitely, absolutely, I will. Great. Hey, now, Father, if uh, somebody wanted uh, a parish was interested in having the uh, Fathers of Mercy come out, how is it that they would contact you? Uh, just contact missions at fathersofmercy.com or go to our website under the mission page. And uh, the the protocol is is that the the pastor would invite us. But it's got great information. If you want to take things to the uh, to your pastor and show it to him, that's it's there. But all of our guys are great. I mean, all of our guys are, they all have a different gift in a, in a different mm. presentation. And, you know, one of my friends said, he said, the only thing you guys have in common is your wardrobe. <laughs> <laughs> sure. We got Father Tom Sullivan is a roofer from Philly. Father Bill Casey was uh, military. Uh, you know, Father Dave Wilton was a medic. I mean, we, you know, all these guys wow. are just, they have wow. such wow. diverse backgrounds and, and great stories, so. Good, good men. Well, uh, this has been the Catholic Forge, and, and to all the listeners, especially as I said before, anyone who stumbled over here through the Fathers of Mercy or uh, if by some connection to Father Ken, thank you for listening. And we'd like to close as always with a prayer and a blessing. But uh, John, if you don't mind, since we have a member of the clergy here, instead of our uh, uh, mediocrity, he outranks us. It's okay. <laughs> I understand. <laughs> Father, would you would you please give us your blessing? The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. And the, may the blessing of Almighty God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit descend upon you, the Catholic Forge, and your listening audience. Amen. 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 God bless you guys. Thank you so much. Thank you, Thank Father. you, Father, so much. Thank you for listening to the Catholic Forge. We hope you've enjoyed this episode and will leave us a positive rating and review on iTunes. How about five stars for Father Ken, okay? Uh, was, <laughs> or also uh, also five, <laughs> five beards yes uh, also you know check us out on SoundCloud or YouTube you can continue the conversation with us on Facebook and Twitter and to get a hold of us you can reach us at thecatholicforge at gmail.com for more information regarding the podcast visit our website at www.thecatholicforge.com we especially thank our merciful wives for their continued support of this project and we thank you very much for listening.